good news of salvation to his people Israel and to all the peoples who have sung Yeshua the Messiah, Lord. Amen. Amen. Baruch Hashem that we can be here. Um, I was listening, I don't know if anyone here listens to Impact, Impact Radio, the Christian radio on the way here, and they were talking about the persecution of Christians all over the world. It's at the highest, um, I don't know if it's the highest it's ever been, but it's highest since they've been recording it. Um, it's only gone up and up and up. And um, something like 370 million Christians have been persecuted in the top 50 countries in the world. And I was thinking how blessed we are that we can come here. Those people can't even talk to their friends or family or anyone if they get caught. They were talking about one Islamic country where the Taliban took over, I can't remember the name now, but it was a recent takeover, that they got a list of all the Christians and they went door to door looking for them and pulling them out of their homes. And um, they were saying how they need prayer. And us as the church really needs to stand up with our brothers and sisters and pray for the, the many millions that have been persecuted for for their faith, for walking, walking the walk. So yeah, I'm just grateful that we can be here free. We're free to, to worship, we're free to have a relationship. We have brothers and sisters we can talk to. If we're in a bad place, we can pick up the phone and, and talk and go for coffee and share to each other. Those people are isolated, really by themselves. So, very grateful that we have, um, that we are still have this freedom. All right, today we are in near, um, Nahum, the prophet Nahum. That's the next one on our list. We'll give you guys a minute or two to find it. <laughs> so, after Micah, we've got Nahum. It's a very small uh, book. Only three chapters, three, three small chapters. Give me a glass of water. Just, yeah, so we've got um, three short chapters and one thing we we must know with Nahum as we're going to read, we're going to read the whole book because there's only three chapters, so we have the time. It's a poetic book. So like the Psalms, it's poetic. Um, it's war poetry that we're going, uh, that we're going to read. It's, it's, um, the book is a battle, a battle scene that we will see. So Nahum, um, what does Nahum mean? The meaning of Nahum is comfort or comforting. Why? Can anyone think of why, it's, why the person writing this book's name means comfort or comforting? Does anyone know who Nahum is written to? So, <laughs> checking the, the cheat sheet. Uh, so Nahum is comfort, comforting, his name means that, and it's written to the Syrians, to the capital, Nineveh, and this is the sequel to Jonah. Alright, if we can think of it like that. It's probably about 120 years after Jonah, but it's very much a sequel to Jonah. So, it's, his name is, means, means comfort because this word is against Assyria. What did we learn that was happening to northern Israel? You guys have heard Assyria, 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 Assyria. Assyria was coming down and destroying the whole northern territory. Assyria had come down and knocked on the door of Jerusalem when King Hezekiah was reigning. What happened? Sennacherib, the, the king of Assyria, he, his general said, Who is your God? No one can stop us. Look, we've taken out all these other countries, Syria, Egypt, 
all the major guys are no no match who do you think you are we take an israel why do you still serve this god basically like job's wife curse god and die that's what he's basically saying and hezekiah went and tore his went before god and tore his clothes and asked you know repented for the people and asked god are you going to allow this man to say these things to you and god wipes out 185,000 soldiers with one angel that night now why do we say this is a sequel to to jonah what happened in jonah at the time of jonah which was approximately about 120 years before this assyria had been the world power but they were slightly going on a downward spiral god told jonah go to assyria and tell them to repent this is going to bring an utter end to them total destruction jonah unwillingly goes and tells him to repent and they do they, they proclaim a fast and they repent and from there assyria that downward spiral stops and god raises them to the top again he uses assyria as a rod of correction to the nations around and to his own people and he brings correction to israel through assyria but now what has happened assyria has become puffed up and very proud and they believe it's their strength and by their hand they've forgotten what happened a lot can happen in 120 years so the book of nahum is telling assyria because i saved you doesn't mean i work for you god god's saying because i saved you doesn't mean now i'm one of your gods you can put as a trophy and i'm going to bring correction now and that's what happens there so he's addressing the syrians but it's bringing comfort so he's not in assyria but he's telling judah because now israel no longer is assyria has wiped israel out um, they came down during the time of Hezekiah. This is now d- during Hezekiah's son reign, son's reign and grandson and great-grandson. So it's during this um, period that uh, Nehemiah is living in. I don't know how long this book was written over, but it's within that period. So the kings of Israel, the kings of Israel is being wiped out, but we're looking at for Judah, Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. If anyone remembers Manasseh, he was probably the worst king Israel had ever had. Uh, sorry, Judah had ever had. Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah, which one of, was one of the, the most godly kings. Hezekiah did a lot of reform, but Manasseh was very evil, brought in child sacrifice. And actually, there was a time in Manasseh's life where he was taken captive, I think by Assyria. Actually, came down and actually had taken cap- uh, Jerusalem captive. Well, yeah, they um, had taken them captive and Manasseh was being taken as a slave and he repented and actually God brought him back and then pros- um, prolonged the life of Judah. So what is the... So Nahum is addressing, he's telling Judah, look, this is what the Syrians have done but God is going to bring correction to them and that's why his name is comfort he he brings comfort to judah knowing that god sees the devastation that this bloodthirsty nation the syrians were known as some of the most bloodthirsty uh, one of the most bloodthirsty nations kingdoms they were very brutal Um, they did not spare life they did life was not sacred to them they had no problem cutting pregnant women open and pulling their babies out things like that um, so god says i see i see it I see what you've done and there will be justice so the date we're looking at is about 664 to 634 bc okay so we're looking about 30 years where um, nahum is is prophesying 34 years so it's within the the reigns of these kings and Nineveh is destroyed so 
he finishes, we can say, if, if, if he finishes prophecy around 34, remember we don't have exact dates, it doesn't say in the book, this is the date, but from the kings that he's um, prophesying to in the time that the destruction of Nineveh took place, we can range it from there. Nineveh was destroyed about 20 years later, in 612 BC. So 612 BC, um, Nineveh was destroyed. So this prophecy came true. The possible um, co-prophets that we're looking at here, and near the end of Nehemiah, um, Nahum's term, so it's not quite the whole time near, uh, Nahum was prophesying, but co-prophets, we look at Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And I, if I remember correctly, Habakkuk and Zephaniah actually are co-prophets together. They prophesy together. So they come about um, near the end of uh, Nahum's prophet, uh, prophetic term, you could say. Where is Nineveh or Assyria? It's modern-day Iraq. Okay, so modern-day Iraq is where uh, Assyria, well, is or was, shall I say, Assyria was. What is the theme? So we're just going to have a look at the theme. So I'm just going to go through the background here and then we're going to read it. Because it's, once we understand the background, then when we read it, it's going to make sense. So the theme, Nineveh, the arrogant capital of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, would be destroyed. So that's the theme of it. The book is that this arrogant capital, they've raised themselves up, and God's saying, I'm going to bring you down. And he uses the Babylonian Empire by the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar to bring the Assyrian Empire to an end. And that happens in um, 612. The Syrian Empire is taken over by, sorry, it's actually Nebuchadnezzar's father that takes it over. He was, I think, a general in the, the Syrian army because obviously Babylon had been taken, the Chaldeans had been taken by them. But um, he revolts against the Syrians and they take over. In 605, um, Nebuchadnezzar becomes king. And um, we know the stories of Nebuchadnezzar with, with Daniel. Which we'll get to soon. Um, we'll get to Daniel soon enough. So the purpose of Nahum was God's messenger like Jonah to announce the fall of Nineveh and the complete overthrow of Assyria. But unlike Jonah, Assyria doesn't repent. You see, Jonah was saying the same thing to Assyria 100, 120 years before. They repented this time. Nahum goes and he says the same thing, but they don't repent, they don't care. Alright, so we can break the book up into, well, three chapters and we can break it up into three portions. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Okay. Chapter 1 is a prelude to the battle. So you can draw your three little block, uh, boxes. So we've got a prelude to the battle. And once again, like I said, it's a, it's a, a war poetry we're looking at here. So it's a poetic book. And it's, it's all going to be poetry. Chapter 2 is the actual battle. So when you're reading chapter 2, we're going to see a lot of battle terminology going on. And chapter 3 is the battle and fall. I need to repeat any of those. So chapter 1, the prelude to the battle. Chapter 2, the actual battle. Chapter 3, the battle and the fall. Okay, let's have a look at chapter 1. I'm not going to read it yet. I just want to bring some highlights and then we're going to, after highlight everything, we'll look at the reading. So God appears to judge evil among the nations. That's the first point. Chapter 1 verse 2 to 8 is who am who i am and why god telling them who i am and why remember assyria thinks god is just another idol on their trophy 
uh, kissed or trophy uh, um, cupboard. All right, we've taken all these gods down. Remember, in those days, if you took the land, it meant your god was stronger than that land's god. But that's not what happened yet. God humbled his people and he used Assyria to humble them. All right, another point um, for chapter 1. Don't think because I let you defeat Israel that I now serve, now, that, sorry, that I now serve the gods of Assyria. Okay, God's saying this to, to the Assyrians. Don't think now I serve you. Chapter 2, we have the fall of Assyria. And if we look at verses 2, 11 to 12, the symbol of Assyria, I just want you guys to make a note there, because it's going to bring in talking about a lion, and I'll, I'll um, talk about this again when I get there, but it talks about Assyria as a lion. So it's going to talk about a lion, and what it's actually saying is Assyria's um, symbol was a lion. Okay, so when you need to understand some of these historical uh, facts, when we're reading these books. Chapter 3, Assyria's downfall. And another point here which is quite interesting is that this chapter 3 is very similar to Revelations chapter 18, sorry, should I say 17 and 18. Alright, if we look at Revelations, God talks about how He's going to bring down Babylon the Great. Okay, He refers to this world power at the time of the end is Babylon the Great um, this mother of all harlotries the ones that have persecuted and spilt the blood of the saints um, there's judgment on Babylon the Great in chapter 17 and 18 of Revelations if you get a chance when you read chapter 3 have a look at the similarity of Revelation 17 and 18 and how God's going to deal with that world system at the end very similar to Nahum. Alright, let's get into Nahum. Chapter 1, verse 1. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Now, they're not really sure where this was. But the fact that he was addressing Judah, we think that he was a, a Jew living in Judah, because Israel was no longer around. Whether he was living in Israel and came down to, to Judah when Israel was taken, we don't know. But he's a Jewish man. Um, we don't know where Al-Kashat um, Al is. Alright, verse 2. God is jealous. And the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm, in the cloud, in the clouds of the dust of his feet. God will avenge the just. He does not just look over wickedness and evil. So never think that why is it's not fair? Why do these unjust get away with what they do? They don't. They don't. No one does. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. Carmel is a mountain where Elijah challenge the, the prophets of all okay it's quite a big mountain and you know god said like his wrath is like you know this big mountain will just melt before him verse 5 the mountains quake before him the hills melt melt and the earth heaves at his presence yes the the, the world and all who dwell in it you know, when I was reading this, it actually reminds me a bit of when Yeshua returns once again. When he says he'll stand, step down on the Mount of Olives and he'll split. You know, that judgment coming. It's not a pretty sight. It's destruction. 
Woe is the day of the Lord. And this is the day of the Lord he's talking about. One of the days of the Lord, you know, where destruction is coming. Verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. It's amazing. It goes from total destruction to the Lord is good. And basically the righteous can trust in him. You see, it depends on which side of the battle you are. Alright, so you standing before him, or should I say behind him, he's going out before you, the line of Judah, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of God's armies. Are you behind him? Or are you on the other side resisting him? Because it's not much of a resistance and there's going to be a lot of destruction. For me, I stand behind him and go, okay, I'm following you. So for those who do that, they are protected. And he is a strong tower, a refuge where we can take shelter. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. And darkness will pursue his enemies. Just a quick reference to that. Um, there's a few times that it talks about a flood uh, one of them is Daniel 9 26 I thought I'll just look at that one reference Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 he says here It's actually from the middle of the verse, but I'll read the whole verse. It says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, the knot for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. God likes using this imagery of a flood, an overflowing flood, like we look at Noah. God used a flood to destroy. Here, Often when we hear a flood, like in Revelation 12, it also talks about a, f a flood. Um, but that comes from Hasatan, when he's pursuing the, the, the people of God. Um, it could mean multitudes of people, a flood of people. Okay, so the end will be with the flood, with the flood of people being destroyed. But it's the same going back to Noah, Noah's flood, you know. Um, it wasn't. It was the people that were being washed away. Anyways, it's just. A, it's, it's not so much linking this. It's just another reference of it, and it's kind of that destruction. That reference in Daniel is talking about the end time, when there's going to be a washing away of the unrighteous. The same here. God saying that there's going to be a washing away of the wicked here in Assyria. He's going to deal with them. Verse nine. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled the thorns, and while drunkard like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble and um, fully dried. So you're going to pick up some of these things that are talking about, you know, um, being given over to drunkenness and so on. You know, just a reprobate lifestyle the Syrians were living. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counsellor. Thus says the Lord, Though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I afflict you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command conquering you. Sorry, concerning you. So, here he's talking about Judah, that, that yoke, that Assyrian yoke on you is going to be broken off now. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved images and the molded image. I will dig your grave for your vile. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. 
I like that verse, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. There is a psalm, I don't know if it's Psalm 21, where it says, From where does my help come from? My help come from the Lord. 121. So he, he looks to the hills. He says, I look to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And it's this poetic imagery that Nahum is bringing in here. And I think a lot of some of these lines it brings on here are drawn from the Psalms. Remember, it's God giving the inspiration. God gave the inspiration for the Psalms. So it's all the same kind of imagery coming through. He looks to the mountains and there he sees the feet of one who brings peace. My Yeshua, my salvation, is coming. Chapter, chapter 2. He um, scatters has come up before your face. Man, the front. So remember, this chapter 2 is the actual battle. So we had the prelude to this battle. Now we go into the battle. Man, the front. Watch the road. Strengthen your flanks. Fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob. Like the excellence of Israel. For the, uh, for the emptiers have emptied them out. And ruined their vineyards. Remember, they were plundered. They were plundered by the Syrians. Uh, northern Israel was gone. Um, during the time of Hezekiah, when Sennacherib sent the, the king of Israel, uh, king of Syria sent down his um, Rebsh king, I think they call him, the, the, the general, and he knocked on the door. While they were coming down, Hezekiah tried to make an offering to Assyria. And they pulled off, they went into the temple and they pulled off the, the gold of the doors and, and they tried to get as much gold as they could and, and plunder to give. So they stripped the temple because the temple in those days was your storehouse, your, your bank. And they, they pulled all the wealth over there and sent it and he said, I don't care that you sent this wealth. Thank you for that, but I'm still coming. Verse 3, the shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished, brandished. So, fighting it seems. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad road. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. So, before I carry on here, make a reference to this chapter for Joel. When we look at the prophet Joel. A lot of the imagery here comes up in Joel. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in the walk. They make haste to her walls and, they, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are open and the palace is dissolved. So you can imagine the Syrian empire is there. They the king the king of the world at that time. But the Babylonian, or the Chaldean prince, you can say, Nebuchadnezzar's father was a general, has risen up against them. There's fighting in the streets. a civil war going on. They, they, they want to break away, get their freedom. But they start a whole new uh, world empire, the Babylonian empire. This is the rise. He's talking about the rise of the Babylonian empire. And the infighting in, in the streets, because it's your yours. Your general is risen up against you now. And there's the civil war that's taking place. It is decreed, verse 7, it is decreed, she shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating her breast. The Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Now they flee away, halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth or every desirable prize. They have, Assyria has plundered the world around them and all those riches are leaving them now. Verse 10. She is empty, desolate and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. You can imagine the people in the cities 
The armies are rising up against them, marching through the streets. You close your doors, your windows, but there's no rescue. Where is the dwelling of the lions? So this is referring to Nebuchadnezzar and that imagery of lions because that was their symbol, the lion. In the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion cub, lion's cub. And no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lioness, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Talking about how Syria went and took and took and took and took and took and took until they were full of the spoils. But also vicious imagery because of their brutality. They ripped the flesh off the bones. They, they brought it back to their den. Verse 13. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. The voice of your messengers. Remember, they'll be sending out their um, ambassadors to different lands. Go, tell them that we will attack them or be a vassal nation. But that's not going to happen anymore. There's going to be an utter end to you. Verse, uh, chapter th- 3. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The, the, nose, sorry, the noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels. The galloping horse, of galloping horses, of cluttering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright, sorry, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries, of the seductive harlots, the mysteries of sorceries. Who sells nations through her harlotries? and families through her sorceries. This imagery is so similar to Revelation 17 and 18 when you go through it. Nothing is new under the sun. These nations repeat the same thing over and over again and there will be a day when it will be the last. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirt over your face. I will show the the nations your nakedness and the nations your shame. There'll be nothing left of them. They'll be totally left bare and ashamed. Verse 6. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comfort from you? Uh, comfort for you? Once again, this is so similar to Revelation 17 and 18. It says that the, the merchants of the world will look upon Babylon the Great burning and they will weep and say, you know, there'll be no trading there anymore. It's gone. It's the same image. The same thing's going to happen. Verse 8. Are you better than no Ammon that was situated by the river that had the waters around her? whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Labim were your helpers, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces at the, at the head of every street. They caused lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall onto the ground of the, of the eater. Like a ripe fruit, there's nothing holding it. Your strongholds, there's no more. Just a little shaking and they fall. There's nothing left. There's no strength in it. Verse 13, surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open 
for your enemy. Fire should devour the bars of your gates. Surely the, the people in your city are women. All the men have been killed. There's only a woman left because of the great war that's going on. Destruction. Verse 14. Draw your waters for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go to the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the bricks, the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. Verse 16. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunder and flies, the locust plunders and flies away. 17. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a, gold, a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. It's interesting, this verse talks about the generals and the commanders. It was their generals and the commanders that rose up against them and wiped them out. So where are they in that day? They know where to be found because they're not on your side. They're busy actually overthrowing you. Verse 18. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. They rest in the dust. They're all dead. There's no more. Unlike Jonah, when they heard the reproach of God, they put sackcloth and they threw dust on their heads and ashes. And they repented. They didn't repent. And if when there's no repentance, all there is is death. We don't to, if he is life, without him there is no life. There is no light. The last verse, 19. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? The nations of the world, when they see the destruction of Syria, will clap and rejoice because of the brutality of this nation. No one will mourn for them or weep. And that's the book. It's a very graphic book. But this is what happens. This is what happens to Assyria. 20 years later, they are wiped out totally. God gives them time to repent. But there's no repentance. And then the day comes. And it's utter destruction. So, we see here God is grieved by the death of the innocent, especially in chapter 1, and there is, there, is ju there is justice done. God's goodness and justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of the oppressive and evil nations. And we see this over and over again. Because of God's justice, he has to deal with evil. He has to deal with um, violence in every one of these nations he deals with alright we still have some time I know it's a, bit, it's a short book but a psalm that I did read which I thought was fitting Psalm 51 Since we have some time, it's not a long psalm, you can read it. Psalm 51. I think this gives us uh, both sides of the story in Psalm 51. Those who are crying out for help, and how God deals with it. Here we have David and how God deals with the wicked. Verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. I believe this is 
you know, Psalm, maybe Hezekiah was, was reading when these things were happening. Later on, you know, when Manasseh had repented and come back to following God and these things were happening, with them being attacked by the Syrians. Um, Ammon was not a good king, but his son Josiah was a very good king, a very upright king, a king that brought great reform. I can imagine Josiah reading this during the time of the Syrian Empire knocking on their doors, trying to bring destruction. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. You guys remember hyssop? In the Passover, they took the hyssop and dipped it in the blood, paid it on the, the wall. When Yeshua wanted to drink, he used the hyssop to drink from. Something that cleanses. Purge me with your hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit, that I may teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. I just think of that. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. This is what the Syrians should have been praying. Verse 15. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with the burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. God hears the cry of Israel and he rescues them from the oppression of the Syrian Empire. We see this over and over again for those who turn to him and repent. He is quick to mercy, quick to forgive. And it's the same with us in our lives where we have gone astray or gone off. If we repent and turn. The word repentance, the Hebrew word is teshuvah, is to turn around and walk the other way. If I'm walking in this direction and I repent, I turn this direction and I walk away from that thing I was doing. That is repentance, is to turn 180 degrees around and turn the other way and walk. We will see now as we go on how the kings of Judah, unfortunately, we've got a king like, you know, I believe God maybe. God brought this rescue because of Josiah being one of the kings during this time that repented and brought reform and God said for you I will give you peace but we see that after him that we have many kings in Judah well not too many left but there's a few more that come that they are evil they do not follow God they do their own their own thing and once again, God brings a rod of discipline. That Babylonian empire that he used to discipline Assyria with, God actually calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Even though Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know what's going on, he's a, a pagan, you know, got their own gods. God uses him, raises them up, and he brings discipline to Judah. And we have that 
um, the captivity of Judah and them taken to Babylon in slavery. So that that is Nahum. Is there any, are there any questions? Any comments? Anything you want to add or questions? I'll see if I can answer it. <laughs> Could you just talk a bit more about the heavy light conflict and the things that are need for it as well? Um, so you said that your defenses you can have heavy light conflict at one start. Uh, this, yeah, the, it's like the late summer fruit. There's a mention of this, I think, in um, Amos. Amos talks about this late ripening fruit. Um, but here I think what it's referring to is that when the fruit is really ripe, <clears throat> it's just hanging on by a thread. You can just, just shake the tree and it'll fall. You can imagine when an army starts marching in and the ground shakes like this figs and this fruit fall off there's no strength in it and um, this is how i see it maybe there's another viewpoint but i see it as like there's no strength left in the city they're they're very what they believed was their strength their army has actually turned against them and has conquered them and there's no strength to with the sandals anyone else anything else nothing Okay, we could just um, end in prayer, and then anyone that uh, needs prayer for anything, welcome to come up. And if you want to stand, sit. Thank you, Abba Father, for your word. Lord, I thank you that... We can come and read and have understanding of the things that have gone on in the past and learn from this Lord and apply to our lives that we may be quick to repent, quick to when we, we get challenged or chastised, may we quickly turn to you, Father. Lord, I thank you for each one here, Lord, each one that couldn't make it, Lord, and ask if there's any sick that you will bring total healing. That you are God of life and a God of healing. And we thank you, Father, that through Yeshua, through, through the price he paid, we have a mediator. And we can come before you and say, Father, may you stretch out your hand, may you bring healing, not just physically, Lord, but physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, Lord. Lord, I ask that your word will touch our hearts, that it will bear much good fruit, that we will walk after you, not just in, in truth, but in spirit. You desire us to walk in spirit and in truth. So as we go out this week, Father, may we be a, a light to the lost. May we be... May we be that light that's so needed. May we bring the good news to those around us and may we, may we walk that good news out Father. We just give you glory and praise and we sure pray. Amen. Amen.